Okay, so welcome to the Scalapinio Mile Track, where all your friends come to cheer you up as you give your first conference lecture. Uh, I realized, <laughs> yeah, I realized that you guys are going to be really tired after lunch, so I created a really colorful presentation to keep you uh, awake, and it has lots of pretty pictures and not so much words. So, my name is Ilan Oga, uh, I'm the CTO of a company called Hello Heart. And I'm here to tell you the story of how we went from being a team of prehistoric programming languages developers uh, to being an awesome Scala team. Or in other words, I'm presenting a case study of how you can train your team in Scala when you have no resources, no time, and zero relevant prior knowledge. <coughs> So, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to start uh, presenting with the presenting the team and the company. We're going to talk about why and how we adopted Scala. We're going to talk about some things we did wrong, some things we did right, and we will conclude with a discussion whether it all was worth it. <coughs> I start by presenting Hello Heart or the setting of our story because I assume at least some of you don't know us, and since we're a mobile health app. For you, I hope that none of you need us. So Hello Heart is a startup that was founded in 2013 with a single goal in mind, uh, to help our users track, understand, and by doing so, to improve their health. Now, <coughs> we are focused on heart health, which is one of the biggest uh, problems in the, the biggest health, uh, health problems in the United States, hence the company name. And this problem costs employers billions of dollars in health insurance every year. So our solution is a B2B2C solution, which helps users check uh, and understand their health parameters and data. And it turns out that when you give people a mo mobile solution that allows them to take control of their health, they do it and they love it. And it works. Research su suggests that by taking your blood pressure alone, you can get measurable improvement in your heart health. So, by helping our users to engage with their health, we help drive healthcare costs down for employers. The company has been extremely fast moving since the very beginning. We've been releasing a, 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 a version with significant features every two weeks for almost the entire lifespan of the product. And this agility is what allowed us to respond quickly to market and business needs. And what made us go from an unknown startup to a highly visible company in our field in a very short time. Now I'll present the characters of our story. Uh, me, I was recently promoted to uh, the role of CTO in the company, and now I do CTO stuff, like building the technological landscape and um, overseeing personal development. But I joined the company almost at the very beginning as a developer. And my first task in this company was to lead the Scala adoption and server development uh, project. Now, before joining Hello Heart, I had no relevant experience to anything I ended up doing in this company. I was not a server developer, I was not a mobile developer, not on iOS and not on Android, and I was definitely not a Scala developer. And I didn't have any functional programming experience. <coughs> I also have an amazing team in this company, uh, which gets endless compliments from our investors and customers alike, and they make everything this company does possible. Uh, on the left, you can see Yuval. He, we, he is our uh, front-end lead. And before joining us, he was a security expert with tons of C++ experience. And in the middle, you can see Stav, who is our Android expert. And before joining us, he was, like me, mainly a J2E and Java developer. By the way, they are sitting here in this room. So if at some point you find my lecture boring, you can try to play Where's Waldo and try to find them between you. But you may have trouble spotting Yuval because he's wearing glasses today. So, adopting Scala. As I said, we have a small company with an itsy bitsy team, you saw all our team, uh, and we are extremely fast moving, and we had no relevant experience to Scala when we started this journey. So, under this condition, why would you, or why would anyone, choose Scala? So, when I started my career, uh, the technological landscape seemed pretty clear to me. 
Um, I was a J2 and Java developer, and it seemed like an obvious choice for server development technology if you didn't want to work with Microsoft products in a Microsoft environment, which we didn't. But then, a couple of years went past, and I raised my head, and I looked around me, and I realized that the technological uh, landscape around me had changed, and that it may not make as much sense for a young startup to choose Scala as its server development technology anymore. Now, if you're sitting in this room, I probably don't need to tell you why, but I will tell you anyway for the sake of completeness and for the people here who, may not, who maybe didn't have any experience with Scala. Um, Java, which was our, the technology we knew, is, uh, is kind of simple, not to say simplistic. And it lacks many features that, any, uh, that other, maybe more advanced languages have. And that makes writing code in Java really, really hard work. Now, Java is getting better over the years. I'm told that Java 1.8 is, is so much better than anything, uh, any version of Java that I'm, I've experienced. But is Java getting better fast enough? Now, Java also kind of feel outdated because it's, while it's still very, very popular in large organizations and in enter enterprises and things like that, no young startup that we know chooses Java for their server development technology today. And the worst thing is that no one seems to want to work with Java. No good developer that I know actively seeks job, which allows them to write code in Java. Now, it may seem like a small thing, but you need to remember that for a tiny startup like us, hiring power is everything. Because we have no money, no resources. It's such a stressful job working in a, in a startup at the beginning of its way. And while we can say to ourselves that our product help, helps our users feel better and it makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside, on your day-to-day -day job, what you really want to do is to work on interesting problems with interesting technology and people you really like. So while Java is kind of okay, it will not crush your business to choose Java for your server, it's not, that productive or work to work, it's not that productive or fun to work with. And frankly, we were simply told that there are better options out there, and we set out to find them. So if you consider adopting a new programming language for your team or for your organization, the first thing you need to do is to be really clear in your head about the things that you care about. Now, we, so this is what we did. We sat down and we think, and we came to the conclusion that the first thing we want is a language that would scale, wi scale well. Um, yes, from the very beginning of the company. We didn't want to choose a language that would allow us to prototype quickly, but will leave us with a messy ball of code once the company and the code base grows. Plus, we're all kind of a cl cleanliness fanatics, and we wanted a language that would go with that. We also really care about static and strong typing, typing because we all had some really bad experiences with dynamic languages, where there's a certain cl uh, class of, uh, of problems that you can only discover in runtime. And personally, I don't understand why anyone would ever want to give up on any measure of security given to, given to you by the compiler. Guys, the compiler is your friend, and friends tell friends when they're trying to do stupid things, like pass a person to a function that expects a car. So that was really important. And the last point was having a good ecosystem uh, and support. Because we didn't want to develop all the libraries we are going to use and all the integration we are going to use ourselves. And we definitely didn't want a language that will disappear from off the face of the earth in a couple of years. Um, and we were also kind of hoping to stay in our familiar zone. So we saw Scala from afar, and it seemed like it had all the things we wanted. It has all the features one could hope for. I'm sure some of you will argue with me about that, but for us, this is how it looks like. Uh, it's a JVM language with compatibility to existing languages, which for us meant staying in the, in, the, in the familiar zone and having all the tools and all the integrations that we wanted. It's uh, statically, it's statically typed, it's functional, it's all that jazz, and we heard that it's extremely productive and fun to work with. And most importantly, all the brilliant kids, all the brilliant kids seem to love it. All the best developers I know are looking for jobs 
in companies that will allow, allow them to write code in Scala. But we still had our doubts. Could it be that only brilliant kids love Scala? Can anyone learn this language? Is it too complicated? And we also heard a lot of horror stories about the, the very steep learning curve involved in learning this language. So we were wor worried because in a startup, you have to run for, uh, forward as fast as you can just to stay alive. We can't afford to slow down. So in attempt to answer all these questions, we sent a scout to fill the area. And yes. Uh, uh, Python, Ruby, um, Groovy, I played with Groovy some, for some time. Um, but the thing about Scala is that we kept hearing, hearing about it from people w we know and trust, and I played with it, and so eventually this is what we, we chose for us. So in, attempt, in an attempt to answer uh, all these questions that we had, we sent a scout to, to fill the area. That was me playing with the code, as I said. And when I started doing this, I didn't have much of a plan of attack. My plan was pretty much to read a book. This is the book, by the way, Programming Scala, second edition. Um, write to the server, and somehow that was supposed to work. But there, was about, there were a bunch of things that were really difficult for me. Um, the first thing is that Scala is an amazing language. And to me, it kind of feels like when it was designed, the people who designed it read about all the, the, the programming language features. They know all the programming language features because this is what they do. And they were like, we want our programming language to have all the feature a programming language can ha have. So it's a huge language with so many features. It gives you so many options. And the fact is that you can end up with a drastically different code style depending on the subset of features that you actually choose to use. Now, since I was learning the language, as I was writing the first version of our code, you could date, at some point in time, you could date parts of my code according to the uh, language features I was learning as I was writing them. So our code became a uh, patchwork of different coding styles. And this is a very bad thing, in my opinion, because I think that uniformity is more important than local code quality. And I'll explain. In my opinion, it's more important that similar problems all over your code are solved in similar ways than solving the current problem you are working on in the best, uh, the best way you know according to your level of knowledge. And I'll explain why. Um, code that has that property is much more predictable. If you have a bug, it's reproduced all over the code. And if a bug is reproduced all over the code, then it's easier to find and fix. This code is easier to understand because everything happens the same way every time. And you don't need to learn something new whenever you approach a new module in your code. It's easier to refactor because it's easier to, so to find all the places where you solve similar problems and change them all at once. And it's easier to extend because you don't have to reinvent the wheel whenever you add a new feature to this code. So in my opinion, this is better, but at the time I didn't know better, so, and I had to deliver, so this is what happened. And over time, I had to develop strategies to minimize that effect. And the strategies, I would argue, is to keep refactoring your code as you are writing it, which kind of sounds dangerous, but if you're going to learn the language as you are developing your project, this is what you want to do. And you want to keep refactoring to reflect your new knowledge and to fix the horrible mess you did in your code. But you need to take that refactoring into account as you are planning and as you are writing your code. You need to take that into account when you are deciding how much time you're going to allocate to each, to each task. And you're going, you need to write code that's easy to refactor. And you need to have good test coverage so that you will know you didn't break anything when you refactored your code. The next problem I had was that um, there's so much more, it turns out, to learning a programming language than memorizing all the language constructs. Uh, the technical name for that is tacit knowledge. 
It's the kind of knowledge that's implicit, that's how to verbalize and how to transfer by writing it or talking about it. Um, in other areas of our life, example of this kind of knowledge is how do you ri uh, ride a bike? You can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book about riding bikes. You can't learn how to play music by reading a book about playing music. You can't learn what a good apartment design looks like by reading text about good apartment design. You need to do these things, you need to see other people do them, and you need to practice them yourself. And in, programming, in the programming uh, world, the kind of tacit knowledge we deal with is how to approach cer uh, certain problems, how to break them down, how to use the language tools in order to solve the problems you have. Now, since I, sorry, and we learn so much of this knowledge uh, without realizing it, when we read other people's code, understand other people's code, copy other people's code, and modify other, people, other people's code. Now, while I do generally make my uh, habit of poking inside other people's libraries, library design is fundamentally different than server code. And each library is different from each uh, other library, and each server is slightly different. And since I was writing the code on my own, in my own room, uh, and I had nothing to compare to, um, I didn't know how good my code was. And to this day, in fact, I have never seen the production code of a system, that I if, of s someone else's system that is similar to ours. So while I do know that my code is working because the company is alive and we have a server and the server generally does what it needs to do, uh, I still don't know how good the design is. So, and there are a couple of things that you can do to fix that. Uh, if you happen to be adopting Scala or you have a new team, what you want to do is have the most experienced Scala technical lead you can have on this case. And you want this person to write the first version of your project and choose the code style and initial design for that project so that other people will be able to follow, to follow his or her footsteps. But if you can't, and this is something that we could have done and we didn't do, and that was a mistake looking back, you should use all the outside help you can get. Because we had people who were willing to look at our code and give us design review and give us code reviews and tell us if we did right things or wrong and we didn't use them as much as we could have. And our code could have looked better if we'd done that. So after about a month and a half of part-time job, uh, we went from having zero Scala in the organization to a working uh, first version of the server. But instead of doing a journey from my comfort zone to Scala land that looked like that, my journey looked like that. And this is what it means to have a steep learning curve for me. Now, admittedly, this, this journey was really fun for me because I got to play with all the funky bugs I found on my way and try all the language features and make all the mistakes and correct all the mistakes. But was this journey good for our company? <coughs> and then, after I passed the initial learning curve, I reached the promised land. And there I learned that Scala is indeed awesome and the rumors weren't exaggerated. So, the first thing I noticed was a major boost to my productivity. Uh, our, my current tasks on the server require zero li z literally zero boilerplate code. And Scala is, a, is much more expressive than any other language I've used before, which means I can get more stuff done using le less code. And if we trust the code complete statistic, which says that uh, the number of bugs per 1,000 line of lines of code is pretty much constant between different programming languages, presumably writing less code means you will have less bugs. But I can't guarantee that. Your mileage may vary. But, but after I started writing code in Scala, suddenly going back to our mobile technology and writing code in Objective-C or Java seems like such hard work. Apart from that, I had all the Java library support I could hope for. And that, mean that meant that I had zero friction integrating with other technologies. Um, 
consuming, outside services, Apple push notification, AWS services. Office document manipulation. Whatever you want, we have a library for it, and it was literally painless to do it. Now, it almost seem, seems unfair for Java, stating this as one of the strengths of Scala, because so much of this uh, power comes from Java's popularity, but that's the way it was. I had literally zero friction integrating with any other technology. <coughs> and the last thing, which I ke keep coming back to because I really love it, um, the type system. I knew that it was important when I started, but I didn't know how important it was. Now, if you go online and you read articles by Haskell developers, you often read them saying that if their uh, programs compile, then they are probably correct and they are working. Now, that's a gross exaggera exaggeration, in my opinion, because you can write stupid code in any language, but there is a certain class of problems that can be prevented, or mostly prevented, by expressing certain invariants of your code in types and letting your compiler help you. If you didn't notice it yet, I love my compiler. And having inferred types in Scala meant that all this power is mostly painless. I'm saying that it's mostly painless because you, s because you still have to work with types and provide types information in some places. Some of it because it's good style and it's generally a good idea as documentation. And some of it because you're trying to do something that's kind of complex with the type system. But in most places you don't have to work with types so, so much, so it's mostly painless. So overall Scala for me has been like a developer amusement park where I have all the features, I have all the power, it's fun, I can play. And the best part is that I think Scala makes you a better developer. And I have a story about that. Eran, uh, who was the previous CTO of the company, uh, started to learn Scala while he was working in our company and then continued on his own after he left. And we met some time ago, and now he's not working with Scala, unfortunately for him, he ri he's writing code in Java, uh, but he told me that learning Scala changed the way he thinks when he's writing code in other languages. So Scala has informed his thinking and made him a better developer using other technologies. So Scala is good for you. Yes, you should eat your Scala. But it couldn't have been all good, and some things had to go wrong, and they did. <clears throat> Once we had the basic project going and we needed to align the entire team with this uh, Scala effort, uh, things started to go wrong because, again, we had no time or money to do that. So we approached this task the same way we approach any other technical task. We gave people p features to develop and we expected them to roll with it. Now, I hear you saying, ah, oh, you crazy woman, this is not going to work for sure. But in most cases, this approach is good enough. This is how we introduced any other technology uh, to our team. But in Scala's case, it turns out that just telling people, yo, this language is amazing, you should learn it, come here, is not good enough. And I think there are several reasons for that. First one is that the reason, in my opinion, the reason you can give people tasks and expect them to roll with them is that most of the time, new technologies we encounter are similar enough to technologies that we already know that the task will not be that hard. Now, that's true especially if you've never tried to learn any new programming paradigm after you finished the, your university years or whatever, however you learned to program. Uh, this is what my mom always says about programming, that the condition is a condition and a loop is a loop in any language. And, but when you're going from writing imperative code to writing Scala code, you can encounter entire code bases where nothing looks familiar. And you have no language construct that you can hang on to in order to understand the code. Now, add to that the fact that in Scala, every library designer seems to want to create a new DSL. Uh, presumably, it's really fun. There is a lecture about that later. And, but what it creates is a really, really high barrier for learning for new uh, programmers in Scala. Apart from that, I'd argue that the right way to approach learning Scala is not as an extended version of Java, but as a completely new programming language. 
and that you should adopt the functional way of thinking from the very beginning. And that means that you're not only expected to learn how your objects or your loop looks in, look in a new language, you are expected to learn new ways to think. Now, <coughs> we, are, we, we usually we feel pretty secure knowing that we are kind of smart because we tackle hard problems as part of our day-to-day -day job. But when you try to learn a new thing, tr a way to think, you need to embrace the feeling that you're, you're maybe, sli you're maybe you're <laughs> slightly slow and slightly stupid until you really, really get it. And this is a blow to your ego. And this is what makes learning new ways to think extremely hard and extremely frustrating. And this is what makes learning, being prepared to learn new things, a very, very courageous thing to do. But learning Scala forces you to deal with that feeling. So this is a really a big emotional burden which stops you from learning. <coughs> On top of that, we had no management commitment to this process at the time. It means that we didn't have the luxury while the team was learning to stop everything and just let them learn Scala at their leisure. We had to move quickly, we had to continue to deliver while bringing people on board this kind of thing. Now, that meant that the team had to keep working under really, really tight deadlines as they were learning Scala. And th this is not the most ideal condition for learning. And the last, the last um, screw in our coffin, uh, while idiomatic Scala encourages, encourages you to adopt a functional uh, style, Scala still has all the old familiar features that you've come to know and love from your, your imperative background. Now, when learning functional style is hard and you have to work under tight deadlines and you have your manager saying, oh, when is this feature out, going to be out? Um, what is going to happen? People tend to gravitate toward their comfort zones. So, it happened, everyone completed their tasks on time, we deliver, this is what we do, this is what we're good at, but we got a code base that was half scalar style and functional and all that, and half something else. So if you're adop adopting Scala, what you want to do is to hold people account accountable for this process of learning, and you want to look into their results, and you want to make sure that their results the, the cold styles, they adopt, the solution they give you are the kind you want. So what happened as a result of our failed attempt? Uh, the, the project was slowly taking shape, but everyone, as I said, gravitated toward their own comfort zone. Uh, Android developers developed Android, I iOS developers developed iOS, and I remained to maintain the server project myself. And that was a problem because I became a bottleneck for any, for any task that required server, de uh, server development for the team. And that meant that when I had other urgent tasks, which happens from time to time, the team was blocked and they couldn't, they couldn't finish their job. And while we have a backup, a backup person for any other technology on the team, so that if someone is sick, if someone is unavailable for some reason, there is someone else to pick up their tasks and back them up, no one could do that for me. And what, what, what's supposed to happen if I'm unavail unavailable from some reason? What happens if I get hit by a truck? What happens if I'm abducted by aliens? Who is there to back me up? And leaving things like that, my friend, would be irresponsible technical management. So a while ago, we got an opportunity to fix this mess. We realized that we reached uh, a point in our company and our uh, product's lifetime where we built a product that our users love and our customers are willing to pay for. And from technical perspective, that meant that while we were still expanding our offer offering with features, they were not as time critical as they were before. And we were dealing with steady growth as more and more customers started to join our, our platform. So we decided that it was a good time to deal with technical debt. And one of the goals we set to ourselves was to teach more people Scala. Now, we knew that this time, if this was going to work, we will need to eliminate all the things that failed us before. So, 
the first thing we asked ourselves is how should we approach this learning task? And we realized that there were two ways to learn. One is to stop everything you do and focus on one thing. Just learn Scala. And then focus on one thing. Develop a sing single uh, Scala feature on the server and repeat and repeat until you know enough Scala to juggle between Scala and your other tasks. But unfortunately for us, while it was still a very co a relatively calm ta ta uh, time for us, we still had urgent tasks that we had to complete. We still had customers waiting with their expensive fountain pens above their checks that they were writing us uh, until we finish implementing the features they are waiting for before they give us money. So we took the other approach, which is to learn a little bit of Scala every day. Now, this is not ideal. Because if you're going to learn a little bit of Scala every day, you're going to have context switches between the training tasks and your normal tasks. And context switches cost time. So when you do things like that, you end up spending more time on training than you would have spent otherwise. Uh, and apart from that, there's always the danger that the lost focus, the focus that you lose as you, do, as you switch context, uh, is going to get you inferior results if you're not careful and, and if you're not managing this process right. But what you do get when you, when you do things like that is flexibility. Because our team members could stop training uh, when they had something else to do and then continue when they could. And that meant the team members could progress with the training plan at their own pace. And this kind of flexibility was what we needed in order to balance between our business need and our technical need to have more people uh, knowing Scala. So, um, what can I say? The bigger uh, time blocks you allocate for training, uh, the more efficient training is going to be. And the smaller time blocks, the more flexible it's going to be. And then we had to revisit the idea of management commitment, which is especially important if you're going to do a little bit of training every day. Now, having management commitment in that sense means that everybody has a shared understanding of the effect training is going to have on the developer's daily tasks. It means that a developer knows that he can say, I'm spending some time right now learning Scala, and management knows that they need to and will postpone certain tasks in order to accommodate that. Now, in all honesty, that requires really, really good communication and, uh, from the developer uh, about deadlines, and it requires really high commitment and ownership of the training process. Now, thankfully, I can say that my team excels at that, but if you're seeing that you have problem in problems in that area, you need to pay close attention to how you time tasks, uh, how the tra training is progressing, and how the regular tasks are progressing to make sure that there is no starvation and that nothing falls, falls between the cracks. And uh, the last thing we wanted to do was to eliminate some of the frustration and cost that came with the steep learning curve. So this is how we came up with the Hello Heart Scala School. Now, it's not a new idea. I bet that everybody in this room has heard about the Twitter Scala School. And if you didn't, I'll explain. A couple of years ago, Twitter released into the wild, that means the internet, a bunch of written material that accompanied a series of lectures they were giving in the company to experienced developers who didn't know Scala but had to become productive in Scala fast. Um, now, I felt the need to create something similar for us because I was looking at uh, resources online and, and in, book, in books, and none of the resources I found contained the exact blend, blend of subjects and exercises to go with them that I was looking for. So we created a, a plan with the following goals in mind. It had to be self-directed. I didn't want to give lectures on each subject that, that would also undermine the idea of having great flexibility. And we had to respect the different learning styles of the team. Because my first assumption when, when I started was that everybody likes to learn like I do, open a book, read it cover to cover, and who are you? No Kung Fu. But no, it turns out that staff, for example, prefers to read short articles on subjects that he is learning, and Yuval prefers video lectures. 
Uh, which is why our training program has a wealth of resources uh, for each subject, and each team member can choose the exact blend of learning style and resources they like to use. We also wanted to promote efficient use of resources. I didn't want our team member to learn all the features of the language. I wanted them to learn the exact uh, amount of features they need in order to be productive, writing code for our server, using the code style that we have. They can learn the rest uh, afterwards when they become more advanced as part of their job, on their own time, whatever. But as part of the training plan, they, they needed to learn the exact blend of subjects that they need in order to be productive writing code for our server. And I wanted the, the training plan to introduce developers to common programming idioms and ways we do things on the server. Because when you open Scala code for the first time, I think that the dominant feeling is the feeling of surprise. Like you're surprised by the syntax, you're surprised by the way things are solved, you're surprised by, by everything you see. And we wanted, I wanted to minimize the amount of surprise a developer has the first time they open the, our server code. And finally, everybody had to be able to measure their own progress toward the goal of being, right, being able to write server code on their own. <coughs> now, the plan itself is composed of small lesson uh, that can be learned uh, in less than an hour. So you can complete each lesson in less than a day. And each lesson has exercises that go with it. And after they finish the exercises, the developers send the exercise to me and I give them feedback and it has two purposes. One is that we don't believe that you can learn a programming language without getting your hands dirty. So they get to practice each one of the, of each, each one of the subjects in the, in the lesson. And the second one is that giving feedback to developers on their exercises allows us to make sure that they are conforming to our code style, the, the code style that we choose. Um, the, rest, the exercises are also designed to make people run on purpose into the kind of problems that guided our standards and our design choices. Because when you spend time trying to solve a problem and you go like, ah, I don't understand why it's, why it's not working, and then you realize that can you walk around it using some kind of standard or some kind of design uh, or some kind of solution in your code, this is going to stick. You are never going to forget why we do things the way we do. And you will know why we do things the way we do. And when you run into this problem again, you will know how to recognize it and how to solve it. And finally, our, exercise, I, our exercises progressively get harder. Uh, and each lesson you add more and more code to the, to, to the exercise and eventually you end up with a project that if you look at it like from afar and you squint your eyes a little bit, it looks like our server code. So when you end your training plan and start working on our server, you have already built a, a similar project to the server. So you know what's going on. So when you adopt Scala, you can't just do it. You have to have a plan and you have to know what people need to know in order to work with, with Scala in your company. And you need to know why they need to know it. And you need to know how you're going to teach, it, to teach them that. And this is our plan. Uh, we started with the basics, classes and objects, because there you have to know that. Collections, immutability, and working with functions. Now, at the beginning, we pay close attention to how you do things in Scala versus the ways you've already known. And we compare the different ways to do things, and of course, we reach the conclusion that doing things the Scala way is so much better. Uh, but apart from that, learning like that really allows you to understand uh, the functional vocabulary. Because when you read about fold, you go like, oh, what does that mean? But after you folded like a thousand lists, you say, ah, this is the way to create some results from each element in my list. And now I have a word for that, which I can use, and it takes me so, so much less time to describe it. <coughs> Next, we focus on stuff that looks strange the first time you see it, because Scala looks strange the first time you see it. Pattern wedging, which is something that none of us had any experience for, uh, with from any other language. We play with it and understand why it looks the way it, it does and what you can do with it. And funky syntax, with, which Scala has plenty of 
Now, most of the time, there's a reason for the funky syntax. Uh, but if you don't know the funky syntax and you don't know why we have the funky syntax, it just makes your life harder. And the Scala code is extremely hard to understand. So this part is meant to create the least amount of surprise, opening Scala code. And then you go to some more advanced stuff, like types, what we said. How do you use types to, uh, to express invariants of your code? Implicit, how we do concurrency. Currently, we only do concurrency with, with futures, so this is what we learn. And finally, we put it all together and create a small play application, which looks like our server code, and we test our code with specs too. Because no, nobody is checking code into our repository without having a comprehensive test for that code. And after a bunch of pair programming sessions and code reviews on real code and real, real server code and real server tasks, you, we are, uh, you are pretty much ready to go and start develop features on your own. So this is how we all learned Scala and reached the promised land together. But was this effort uh, worth it? Um, I'd say that from a technical perspective, Scala is a good language choice for the organization. It's a good technical language choice. It will be productive to work with. It will be fun. It has great hiring power. You will have all the library support that you need. But uh, if you don't have people that know Scala already, the steep learning curve will probably be an issue. And we could have managed that, that problem better and you have the option to, management, to manage it better. So you should be prob probably be mindful of how you introduce Scala to your team or to new, in new, in new individuals on your team. Now, I'm very proud of the things that we've learned and the progress that we've made. Uh, but knowing some of you and the amazing things that you do with this language and this technology, I know that we still have many things to learn and so many ways to grow. And I can't wait to find out what we can become. Thank you.